we have Tony David. Tony David is the director of the environment division at the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe, SRMT, and has more than 20 years of experience in expanding the role of SRMT in the management and restoration of aquatic resources. In 2016, he led the decommission and removal of the, the Hogansburg hydroelectric project. Um, as a result, SRMT became the first tribal nation to remove a licensed dam in the U.S., which restored ownership to the project lands to SRMT, restored hundreds of miles of connecting habitat, and cleared policy obstacles for other tribes. In 2007, he developed SRMT's Clean Water Act authority through federally enforceable water quality standards. The US EPA recognized Tony in 2017 with the Environment Champion Award, the highest award granted to, civil, um, to civilians by the agency. He currently serves as a member of the US section of the International Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River Board. His appointment by the International Joint Commission began in 2017, coinciding with the approval plan of 2014. He received a Master's of Professional Studies from Cornell University in 2005 and a BA from SUNY Buffalo in Environmental Studies in 2001. Please welcome, talking about the importance of polishing the covenant chain to fisheries restoration, Tony David. Well, it's, well, it's wonderful to be back here at the, the chapter meeting and thanks for the invitation to present and share. Um, I'm going to take I'm going to ask you for a little bit of latitude here, because this is not the typical type of presentation given at the chapter meeting. And uh, my instructions from the chapter president were sufficiently vague, so <laughs> please bear with me. But um, the purpose of this talk is to examine the ways to form strong partnerships with tribal nations and address mutual management, uh, mutual resource management goals. Now, the term the covenant chain is really a traditional teaching of the Haudenosaunee or the Six Nations. And it's about pro protocols and renewal of responsibilities to each other. Whether you realize it, realize it or not, we are still bound by these covenants. And the protocols require us to polish and renew them from time to time. Now, the tribal nations in the state of New York include the Haudenosaunee or the Six Nations, as I mentioned, but also the, the Shinnecock and Long Island. And tribal nations in New York have a unique legal status that predates the establishment of the United States. So terms like tribe or nation are indicators of complex histories of our gov governing institutions. So for example, I work for the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe, which uh, governs the southern portion of our territory on the St. Lawrence River. And that is different from the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne, which is a first nation that governs the northern portion of the territory. And not to be confused with the Mohawk Council, the Mohawk Nation Council of Chiefs, which are the um, the traditional form of governing system that, that, that goes back a, um, a, a long time. It, it is important to understand that our traditional governing governments can be different from those recognized by state, provincial, and federal governments. Across the United States, there are more. There are 574 federally recognized tribes, and in Canada, there are uh, 630 distinct indigenous communities, and. Um, Indigenous peoples in the United States and Canada have um, a distinct legal status. Um, notice I didn't say racial status, and that's really important. Um, now, policies for guiding interactions with tribal nations are, are, are varied, but uh, recent examples include um, the uh, executive order from President Biden, uh, and that it focused on terms using terms like uh, supporting self-determination. and. Really what this is, is a shift of, instead of um, uh, re reforming how the federal government interacts with tribes, but to support tribes in making better decisions in how they govern themselves. And you may also recall how the DEC is, is guided with uh, Commissioner Policy 42. And it fosters this government-to-government -government relationship and supports engagement with uh, developing uh, cooperative agreements. Incredibly important. Um, the CP42 also um, uh, reiterates some of the, the concepts that have been long-standing guiding principles uh, for engagement with Indian tribes, such as um, this concept of, of peace and friendship and the bonds that, that bind us. So, um, Indian nations have a lot to offer as the original inhabitants of this land. Uh, understanding, they had a deep understanding of natural systems, values based on reciprocal nation, reciprocal relationships with all of creation, 
and it can be difficult to develop partnerships with some tribal nations, and some may be reluctant to accept help. Now, before we do this, before, I would like to review a few things with us about our shared history that I think will be important to go over. It's not my intent to put all this on you. Um, most of it, most of the, these things happened a long time ago, but it's important to summarize how we got to this point in order to understand the path forward. When we talk about the narrative of the pre-contact era uh, for indigenous people, it's full of remarkable ac accomplishments, not just to survive, but also to flourish across a variety of harsh climates. We developed technology based on renewable resources and an understanding of the teachings that accompany these developments. Our agricultural systems led to the development of sedentary societies and complex governing systems. However, the lens through which these accomplishments are viewed includes labels such as primitive. And as for indigenous agriculture, some scholars characterize these developments as the most primitive of a primitive. Um, so it's important to be cognizant of this institutional bias that is uh, sometimes uh, uh, ingrained. And you know, as for the, the Six Nations, the Haudenosaunee, um, the, their, their governing system was so sophisticated and, and complex that actually the founding fathers were counseling with um, the, the chiefs from the, from the Haudenosaunee, and those consultations led to the drafting of the Articles of Confederation. So there was a direct link and re mutual respect for how we were governing um, over this land uh, for, for uh, a millennium. Uh, but also, I would ask that we consider that um, traditional ecological knowledge is not primitive as well. It's sophisticated, it's complex, and it describes our relation with our resources and um, can be very informative in, when in establishing management goals. The next era that I'd like to talk about briefly is the colonization and treaty era. For the Haudenosaunee and Six Nations, uh, agreements, including treaties, are recorded in strings of wampum woven in belts. The upper left, the Turo Wampum Belt, or Gaswenta, re represents an agreement between the Dutch and the Haudenosaunee. The, the canoe and the ship are, are set in parallel courses and not to interfere with one another. So the, the canoe is, and, and, the, and the ship are the, the purple, the purple rose. The Wampum Belt on the bottom is known as the Silver Covenant Chain. And these bonds of friendship are represented by two figures joined hand in hand. And it said that from time to time, when the relations become strained, it's important to get back together and, and polish that, that chain and re re remove the crud and remind each other of our responsibilities to each other. The United States Congress ratified treaties with tribal nations, like the Treaty of Canandaigua. And these treaties were ratified into law. But the treaties are also represented by um, the wampum belt in the middle, which is which uh, includes several figures joined hand in hand. Now, the building of partnerships with tribal nations was not only strategic, but it was a matter of survival for both parties. The next era uh, is the removal era, and in 1820. The expansion of the, United, of the U.S. required the displacement of tribal nations. And in, these actions were in direct conflict with treaties ratified as law. President Andrew Jackson, with the support of the United States Congress, enacted lethal policies of Indian removal, such as the Trail of Tears. Um, it's, just, it's also important to know that the presidents, the history of the presidents of the United States have a different context when it comes to indigenous peoples. And so the connection with Andrew Jackson and the Trail of Tears is very strong. Um, our interaction, our, our historical um, relations with uh, George Washington, you know, we call him Lady Nagainis Washington, right? Um, that means the destroyer of our towns, destroyer of our villages, right? So the, I, the iconography, the, the symbols of, of using presidents um, have very deep meaning to us for specific reasons. So, you know, I can't help but m just mention just the, the subtext of honoring the Navajo Code Talkers, um, in front of the portrait of the, the author of The Trail of Tears. You know, so I, I think it's important to be aware of this history because um, you know, certainly these things have meaning to us. But during the era of, of Andrew Jackson, 
it seemed that tribal sovereignty was all but doomed, were it not for a lifeline that were extended from an unlikely place, the Supreme Court. So in, sorry. The fate of tribal sovereignty was in jeopardy, and Chief Justice Marshall is credited with three decisions that reaffirmed the legal status of tribal nations. First, that U.S. citizens cannot buy land from tribal nations. And second, that tribes have a legal status as domestic dependent nations, or as a war to its guardian. In other words, the fiduciary responsibility of the federal government. And last, the policy of non-intercourse, so that states couldn't go and make agreements or compacts with tribes. Um, during this time, compacts with tribal nations were necessary for trade, for security, and expansion. And if states were able to strike deals with tribal nations, that could weaken the federal government. So um, we know there's a lot of uh, native historians and scholars point back to this Marshall Trilogy as a time where um, the tribal sovereignty was really fomented in law. The next era would be the reservation era. And the intent of the reservation era was to restrict tribes to reservations and clear territories for Western expansion. As assimilation into American society and way of life, many tribal members became dependent upon food rations provided by the government. And just a snapshot of what the tribal territories looked like in, um, in, 18, in 1939. This is followed up by the allotment and assimilation era. So the, the Dawes Act authorized the president to break up reservation land which was held in common by tribal members. Um, and it was done into smaller allotments that parceled out to or sparse, parceled out to individuals. The intent was to divest unutilized native land to provide to settlers. Reservation lands were managed by the US, and you may recall the Cobell Settlement, um, recent announcement with the Cobell Settlement, um, where tribal beneficiaries were awarded uh, 3.4 billion from the Department of Interior and the US Treasury. And so these lands were managed and held in trust for tribal members. And um, unfortunately, the Department of Interior did not do a very good job at tracking how that money was collected or how it was uh, distributed to tribal members. But following the, um, also included with this, in, within this era, is the era of, of residential schools. And Indian residential schools were built across the U.S., and Native children were forced to attend faraway schools like the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. My, many of my great-grandparents' generation attended Carlisle, and records of their time there, grades, and health records and correspondences are available online. On the lower left is a picture of my great-grandfather, John Terence, and a letter requesting at the age of 20 to be readmitted back to Carlisle which was responded with a letter from the superintendent saying that you're, you're timed out, it's time to move on. Many former students of Carlisle, uh, like John, did not have a home to return to. And unspeakable traumas inflicted on Native children have been passed on, including the remnants of shame of Indian culture and, and language. This is also followed up by the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924, this brought birthright citizenship to natives born in the U.S. Uh, it was also to provide native veterans of World War I with military benefits. Now, many within the Haudenosaunee have not accepted U.S. citizenship, and they view it as an affront to their sovereignty and a violation of their treaties. Now, beginning in 1934, the pendulum started to swing back in the direction of self-governance. Now, called the Indian New Deal, more power would be granted to tribes to provide them, provided they conform to governing structures that are approved by the Secretary of Interior. So, develop a tribal council, adopt a constitution, tribal courts, and, and things of that nature. This was followed up, followed up by the termination era. So, as a reversal of self government, government governments, Congress adopted policies under the termination era to end the special trustee relationship with tribes in order to free tribes from the ward status but also to relinquish federal responsibilities in the process. House Res Resolution 108 in 1953 called for the termination at the earliest possible time of all Indian tribes in California, Florida, 
in New York and Texas. And from 1953 until 1970, Congress initiated 60 separate termination proceedings against Indian tribes, and over 3 million acres of tribal land were relinquished as a result. The effect of termination was devastating for many tribes. First up for termination was the Menominee tribe of Wisconsin. And um, President Nixon reversed this action with, by signing the Menominee Restoration Act in 1973. Um, but this is a, an, an example of, of um, how these ill thought out policies were executed. And um, the, the dissolving of the, of the Menominee Reservation created the Menominee County which had some of the lowest, poor, uh, lowest standards of living in, in the state, um, and it was an abject failure. But the interesting thing is, and for me personally, is when I look at House Resolution that had specific language about the termination of tribes in New York, um, if you look at this in, in the context of, um, you know, we, we, we tend to focus on the natural history and these different eras within natural history and natural resources. But if you also look at the history of Indian policy and overlay that with what we see that happening in natural resources, there are some parallels that pop up, some, some commonalities. And you know, at the timing, during the timing of termination in the U.S., it was also a time of expansion and hydropower development, which included hydropower projects located on the lands of the Seneca Nation of Indian, on the Allegheny River, uh, the Tuscarora Nation, and near Niagara Falls and the Mohawks of Akwesasne, as John mentioned earlier about the, the FDR project. So thankfully these, fire, these projects did not require termination, but they did consume thousands of acres of tribal land. And lastly, before we pivot into the next part of the talk, just wanted to talk about the self-determination self era. This era is characterized by an explosion of civil rights and activism, including the American Indian Movement takeover of the Bureau of Indian Affairs headquarters in D.C. This culminated with the trail of broken treaties to highlight poor living standards on tribal territories and violation of treaty rights. Indian tribes, having an inherent and sovereign status, uh, have an inherent and sovereign status. The act trans transferred responsibility and funding from the federal government to the two tribes for, directly for the purpose of, of self-governance. So these areas of, of self-determination um, are some of the basic amenities that you would expect from uh, civic government. So healthcare, police, courts, things of that nature. So rather than the BIA coming in and having it uh, safety provided by a BIA police force, um, tribes are able to develop their own police force, develop their own health clinics, um, have a greater say in how uh, they, they are governed. Now, the elements of self-determination take us back to one of the earlier slides, and it is what tribal nations have been asking for all along. Acknowledging the land is a good start, but acknowledge the treaties and acknowledge the history. These wampum belts are agreements, but they're also protocols. And naturally, we need to remind each other of these agreements, and when the chains of friendship become tarnished, we polish and renew those bonds. It's a reminder of the obligations made generations ago, and there is strength in those bonds. How many times do you want to turn? Okay. So, you know, one of the traditional teachings um, that's been, uh, uh, I think is a good illustration, dates back to some of the earliest days. It's called the Edge of the Woods uh, Protocol. And it's where a, uh, a visitor coming to the, the nation would stand at the edge of the woods and build a signal fire. And that smoke would rise up to the um, rise up where people from the village would see that and dispatch uh, a group of runners to relay messages. And, you know, I think this is apropos about just how we engage with tribal communities because, you know, a lot of times we, I don't want to say force ourselves, you know, but um, as, a tri as a member of, of um, the tribal government, you know, we are bombarded with opportunities for partnership, you know, and we have limited time. Um, limited resources and limited ability, um, but also you know there's a reluctance about what the intentions are. You know even when the intentions are good. Um, I hope you understand that through the previous slides 
Like we've had a lot, we've had decades and decades and decades of, of help and for our, for our benefit uh, that has not always been successful. And if you're interested in re uh, learning more about this, um, you maybe want to check out the, the link, but um, the Edge of the Woods protocol is about uh, how, we, how we establish contact and how we nourish our minds and nourish our bodies and prepare ourselves for uh, engagement and sharing ideas. But, you know, I also put together some examples, I think, which are, are good examples of how self-determination can be successfully deployed in management of natural resources. And uh, these partnerships lead to success in the field. On the St. Lawrence River, the San Francisco Tribe and the Department of Environmental Conservation are co-coordinators in the restoration of the area of concern as equal partners in the evaluation of Superfund cleanup. This leads to unprecedented cooperation in fieldwork, joint review of documents with EPA and the responsible parties, and agreement on restoration goals and those informed by traditional ecological knowledge. This team has tremendous momentum moving ahead and once the, all of the restoration for our three Superfund sites are completed, um, they're posi well positioned to implement uh, comprehensive restoration uh, outcomes. I'll give you an example. Uh, on the Grass River, we're working with uh, our partners and following the remediation of nearshore areas, uh, we, were, we agreed to have input on what types of species would be planted post-remedy, re post, uh, and those include species of cultural importance, including medicinal plants. So having that um, information up front can be built into those plans and help us to achieve mutual goals. This partnership also led to tremendous coordination with fieldwork uh, through the remediation, prior to remediation of the Lower Grass River, where seven and a half miles of the river were, were dredged. Um, these teams work together to relocate 500,000 freshwater mussel species prior to the dredging. So those are um, aquatic organisms that would have been sacrificed as part of the remediation. And so those fish or those uh, organisms have been relocated to um, an unimpacted location upstream. And the, the tribes also work to develop its own um, mussel hatchery. And we've successfully propagated freshwater mussels in a, in a laboratory environment. So. Tremendous opportunity now, post-remediation, not only to look at fish species, but also to look at mussels as well. Another great example in the state forest, SRMT and DEC developed a cooperative agreement for the Brazier State Forest Management Plan. These efforts included pesticide treatment for control of emerald ash borer and improving stands of black ash, a species of immense cultural importance. The black ash is the sole species of tree harvested for splints, which are made into baskets. Now, while EAB cannot be eradicated, these practices do buy time for develop, development of longer-term solutions that support Mohawk bas basket makers. And perhaps not the purest form of self-determination, but SRMT took a calculated risk to decommission and remove the Hogansburg Dam as a licensee under the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. The success of this project was the result of years of study in partnership with the USGS Tunison Lab and the US Fish and Wildlife Service to understand the ecological value of dam removal. Now, SRMT, as we mentioned, is the first tribe in the United States to remove a licensed dam. Um, and the ownership of this land was re restored to us for the first time in, in almost 200 years. And so we understand, and so now we are currently undertaking steps on this site to develop um, a public park. And I also want to mention that um, during the decommission of this, this project, and Andrew may appreciate this, um, we implemented a gradual drawdown of the impoundment so that we would buy us time to relocate aquatic organisms. And it wasn't a permit requirement, um, but it was just the right thing to do. And so we worked with, um, in concert with the, the dam operators, uh, myself as the project manager for this part, but also with Jessica Jock in the remediation and restoration program to scan the, the areas of the impoundment, collect freshwater mussels, and relocate them to an area that's not un, unimpacted. And for um, the natural resource damage settlement case, so this is for the St. Louis River, uh, this was against the three responsible parties, 
it took over 20 years to, to settle, but SRMT is the lead administrative trustee for the $20 million settlement. This settlement includes $8.4 million in cultural damages. SRMT created the Aze Ji Dewando, a master apprentice program rooted in Mohawk language immersion and the development of traditional skills in horticulture, medicines, hunting, and trapping, and river use. As a result, a new generation of Mohawk language speakers have learned the traditional skills of the community elders and will be passing these on uh, for generations to come. So self-determination builds on the strength of being partners in conservation. It takes time to build this trust, but, there are, but these are long-term relationships. Supporting tribal nations in achieving their goals under self-determination will help many of you achieve your goals as well. In spite of our dark shared history, under self-determination, tribal nations stand ready to engage and to remove the tarnish and re renew the covenant chain of partnership. Thank you.